<laughs> okay, but let's do this. I would like to welcome everyone who joined uh, us tonight. So we are starting our summer edition of uh, Sliver's Greater Futures. I'm Maya and I will host our gathering. And since uh, we are in this new format and nobody is really an expert, I would right, right away like to encourage the audience to use the chat option, which is at the bottom, to uh, place uh, questions during the talk. And then to use the raise hand option, which is in the participant window, to get into the discussion afterwards. So for the sake of this new format, I will try to be uh, as brief as possible, but still, I want to sketch out quickly why and who we have the pleasure to hang out uh, today for the next hour or so. So as a reminder, this academic year, uh, Sliver is looking at approaches to the futures of world building. And the perspective tonight, I think, spans between cosmic dust and the power of shit. And while we were closer to the fictional realm in the previous lecture, today we might see that reality can be even stranger than fiction. And dude, I think to the COVID-19, uh, it's probably more true than ever. But Lydia Calipuliti, our guest tonight, works on archives and creates historic machines of non-linear histories connected to ecological design, which become generative from contemporary concerns. So in this way, the past, the present, and the future get intertwined in a non-linear manner, and in doing so, offer even a reconceptualization of time itself. To describe the present, yet before COVID, uh, in her own words, I would like to quote, at present, in a world that has suffered severe loss of natural resources, economic and political instability, Architecture can neither be solely directed to the ethics of the world's salvation, nor to an archaic recovery of lost disciplinary tropes. Rather, it needs to be appraised as a psychospatial or mental position, fueling a reality of change, motion, and action. This position differs from utopia in that it does not, that it, uh, in that it does not explicitly seek to be right. It recognizes noise, pollution, and waste as generative potential for design." End of quote. Lydia Calipoliti is an award-winning architect, engineer, scholar, and curator with a PhD of uh, Princeton University and a Master of Science in Architecture Studies from the MIT. Currently, she is an assistant professor at Cooper Union in New York and prior to Cooper Union directed the Master of Science in Architecture program at Rensselaer uh, Poly um, Polytechnic Institute. She was an assistant professor at Syracuse University, assistant professor adjunct at Columbia University, and at the Cooper Union serves as a senior associate at the Institute of Sustainable Design. Lydia is also the principal of the Anna Cycle Think Tank, which is based in Brooklyn, New York. As already outlined with her quote, her research focuses on the intersections of architecture, technology, and environmental politics, and more particularly on recycling material experiments, theories of waste and reuse, as well as closed and self-reliant systems and urban environments. Her work on the intersection of cybernetics and ecological theories is presented in a variety of media, including online digital platforms, lexicons, databases and archives, exhibitions, and holographic animations, which uh, with the scope of engaging a wide audience in what she calls immersive scholarships. She has been published internationally in magazines and authored books such as The Architecture of Closed Worlds, or What is the Power of Shit, which bring us back to, the lec to today's lecture. And although I think our current situation captured all of us somehow in our own closed world, uh, where within our little bubbles we watch the outside world passing by. I am very, very, very happy that we are able to gather today and to have Lydia with us at, uh, at Sliver. And without further ado, I would like to hand over to Lydia. Thank you, Maya. That was such a wonderful and thorough introduction. I feel very honored to be with you and uh, very appreciative of this invitation. Um, and um, at some point, I would love to come to Vienna uh, with my physical body. 
um, and touch you all. Um, so I will start sharing my screen. Yeah, let's see. Does this work well? Uh, oh, okay. So, so you should have a share screen green button at the bottom. Yeah, I know that one, but it says host disabled participant screen sharing. Yeah, and this is not. Okay. So I think uh, Rosita has to I allow me. The host again. Okay. Okay. Now I it should work, right? Perfect. Okay. Wonderful. So. So can you all see my screen right now and hear me? Okay, wonderful. So um, thank you again, uh, Maja and um, the Angevanta so much for this very kind invitation. And um, this, uh, this book, which I wrote in 2018, um, which has seemed to represent a kind of marginal history um, has um, and becoming an eerie representation of the world as we experience it today. Um, so I will start by um, um, giving you some thoughts on the book and going deeper into the content. The first title, The Architecture of Closed Worlds, uh, was inspired by a very canonical history of environmental uh, design, um, Rainer Banham's The Architecture of Well-Tempered Environment, uh, but I wanted to supplement that with a subtitle, which was much uglier and raw, uh, What is the Power of Shit? Uh, to complement this kind of monitoring, controlling, and regulation of climates as a kind of performative or design activity with the raw, visceral nature of materiality and uh, possibly the uncontrollability of the action to control all kinds of material infrastructures. Um, so to begin with the content, um, I'd like to, a very basic question is, what is a closed world and how was it defined within the context of this book? I'm definitely not the first person that has used this term. In fact, um, a historian of science that I really value, Paul Edwards, uh, who's a professor at Michigan, wrote a book called A Closed World. And um, his history was uh, recounting a revisionist uh, history of computing in Cold War America, understanding the idea of a closed world as a kind of information feedback loop that uh, feeds itself um, and recreates new pieces of information through this endless cycle. In my book, I'm, I'm examining a parallel history historically, yet very divergent in the context, a genealogy of contained microcosms with the ambition to replicate the earth in its totality, a series of living experiments that forge what I have tentatively called a synthetic naturalism, where the laws of nature and metabolism are displaced from wilderness to the domain of cities and buildings. And the idea of the world in a bottle is nothing new to architects. Here we see, um, and uh, very familiar to, um, to the Austrian, I guess, context, um, a piece of House Rucker Co. Uh, for an art fair in Cologne in 1973, uh, Einstück Natur, a piece of nature, which became the cover of Casabella magazine in 1976. Um, and it, it kind of encases the primitive hut of Logier uh, within a jar, um, which makes us think that it's not just a kind of act of encasing uh, nature or a piece of nature, but the fact that nature has become a fossil, a kind of lost premise of the untamed and uncontrolled open land. So a closed world, as Paul Edwards has described it, is radically divided against itself, turned inexorably inward, without frontiers or escape, a closed world threatens to annihilate itself, to implode from the inside. In fact, architecture's role in the reconstruction of idealized microcosms is tied to the history of utopia. And here we see one of the most representative images of the closed world, which is a speculation, a famous iconic speculation in the history of architecture by Buckminster Fuller and Soji Sadao, the dome under Manhattan, to really cap and shield 
and environmentally control a certain part of the population of, of residents under an atmospherically controlled dome. Uh, very similar uh, projects of, of putting the bubble as a, in the, at the frontier of, of innovation and uh, architectural imagination in the 1960s was also Rainer Banham's environmental bubble. So these examples are iconic illustrations of a period of intense environmental anxiety, precisely because they manifest like fossils in jars, our lost idea of the untamed land. In fact, our canonical understanding of utopia is actually close to the idealization of a closed system. And here we see probably the image that reifies or represents the canonical version of utopia, Claude Nicolas Ledoux's uh, Arc de Seance. Um, and what it was is it delineates a perimeter, a self-sustaining physical environment that is clearly demarcated from its surroundings by a boundary that does not allow for the transfer of matter and energy. In the post-war period, this idea of utopia reappears through the reenactment of whole earth systems. The recirculation of resources in the global ecosystem was idealized in the idea of circularity and containment in a number of projects that proliferated following World War II. In this sense, closed worlds have not only been key sites of engineering and environmental production, but they have also material, materialized a utopian project to temper and fabricate environment as a site of architectural production. However, closed worlds are no longer utopic metaphors for lost utopias. And even though this image is from uh, Jacques Tati's famous movie, Playtime, it really does represent a very prevalent reality of the corporate interior that is absolutely controlled atmospherically and physically as an invisible environment. Closed worlds have become profitably real. Our indoor environments today are in fact politically charged spaces that reflect social ideals and culturally specific standards of taste and judgment. Confined within artificial enclosures, environmental control has enforced biased standards of life, even though in most cases, these standards institutionalize absurd criteria that homogenize ideas of comfort and well-being for the entirety of the human race. In many ways, therefore, closed worlds are also power structures that maintain and manage constancy over bodies and psyches. The medium to do that is the establishment of this thing, the psychrometric chart, and the idea of the thermal equilibrium which is applied to most building systems, most um, kind of corporate office environments that are built today in the Northern Hemisphere. And the thermal equilibrium in interior spaces has been established since the 1950s. Sequestered comfort zones that are held within narrow ranges between the kind of lines that you see in the psychrometric chart. This idea reflects an understanding of the body as a tool within a constant atmospheric medium in order to control and predict its behavior and growth. It is precisely this mechanical vision of biology that gives life a specifically modern character. If organisms, either people or plants, are examined explicitly as mechanical structures that serve a physical equilibrium, one cannot account for the complexity, but neither for the beauty of life. So in the book, I argue that the history of 20th century architecture, design, and engineering has been strongly linked to the conceptualization and production of closed systems. As partial reconstructions of the world in time and in space, closed systems speak to the eerie transference of life using architecture as a medium and a vessel to secure a compulsive cycling of matter, energy, data, and capital. The projects that are documented in the book represent entirely antithetical political ag agendas. They actually range from military experiments to ensure sovereignty over territories in outer space to the nostalgia of the homesteading movement and the utopia of the idea of self-reliance to more recently, the very questionable concept 
of ecological tourism and environmental capitalism. In every case, all of the case studies that are analyzed are real. Uh, they have been applied. They're not speculative like Bucky's bubble, for example. And they're invested in the strangeness of the real. They are not experimentally implemented. Um, they are implemented and they're not based upon speculation. But to witness the journey of the ideological migration that I'm trying to analyze in this book, I'm going to show you three case studies and kind of go deeper into um, the, a manifesto for closed worlds and the power of shit. And I'm going to start with the most famous closed world in existence, um, the Biosphere 2 in Arizona, one of the most contested um, infrastructural experiments in existence. And uh, the idea of self-organization versus Darwinian evolution. So many of you might know this. It's a very famous example. Biosphere 2 remains the largest and most famous ecological, closed ecological system that has ever been built. Its purpose was to test the viability of a biologically regenerative artificial environment that supports human habitation in space and to provide a prototype Earth colony in case the earth would be destroyed. It was built by a company that was self-proclaimed Space Biospheres Venture. That was a partnership between Ed Bass, that was a businessman who financed this project and spent approximately $200 million to build it and sustain it. And John Allen, that was a systems ecologist and an environmentalist. Biosphere 2 supported two missions with the first team of researchers entering the facility in 1991, locked from the exterior world for two years and 20 minutes. The team produced their own food and air supply within a heavily sequestered series of ecosystems. During the entire experiment, all of the crew's waste, including waste from their domesticated animals, was recycled through natural low-tech filtration methods. What Biosphere 2 is famous for is for its very public and spectacular failure. And I'm going to explain why you're seeing this weird ant on, on your screen. The first mission that, that lasted for two years and 20 minutes was notorious for technical and operational failures, especially for not creating enough oxygen. There are several theories why the oxygen levels dropped. Uh, one was that uh, concrete, while it was curing, was absorbing oxygen, something that, that was not calculated within the mathematical equations of all feedback loops. Another uh, theory was that while soil uh, was, was growing plants, it was absorbing more oxygen than anticipated. But the reality is that levels in the facility of oxygen dropped by 6%, which is very substantial, and, uh, and oxygen had to be pumped from the outside. But along with this kind of shortage, there were other failures. Um, there were an unanticipated species like cockroaches and crazy ants that thrived. This is one crazy ant. So there, were, there was a ton of these creatures, almost like the, the kind of manufactured ecosystem has regressed to a previous time era where uh, new species were developing, thriving, and living. Another unexpected example was hunger. The Biospherians suffered from hunger throughout the two years of their residency. And here you see one of the Biospherians losing about 13% of his body mass throughout the residency. The second mission became infamous not for technical failures, but for mutiny and public feuds among different stakeholders that were involved in the facility's management. In time, the philosopher-scientist figure, which uh, John Allen, which is uh, the person you see on the screen, started arguing very intensely with Ed Bass, the guy that financed the project. The latter camp claimed that Allen and his synergists were a cult that were destroying the scientific credibility of the project, with Bass taking action in hiring the now controversial white nationalist Stephen Bannon to run Space Biosphere's venture. The involvement of Bannon, who was at the time manager of Bannon & Co, was detrimental to the project. 
With Bass and Bannon's endorsement, the second team of biospherians who entered the facility in 1994 were ambushed by federal marshals. The two men had concluded that the founding management team included Allen and his cult synergists had to go. In retaliation, Allen's scientists sabotaged the second experiment by opening the airlocks, claiming concern over the health of the inhabitants and were later arrested. The mission was compromised and it ended soon thereafter. Bannon also had an open quarrel with this biospherian that was in mission one, Abigail Ailing. Uh, their quarrel was originally published in the Tucson Citizen in 1996 and resurfaced in the media during the US presidential elections in 2016. It disclosed a series of threats, insults, and accusations of sexual harassment. Arguably, the, ma the material problems of the first mission became social and political problems in the second and final human mission. Both events revealed that dynamic equilibrium of material exchange in an arbitrarily chosen part of the Earth's biosphere cannot just set in spontaneously. Redundancy of species and the logic of inclusiveness did not automatically lead to the cybernetic equilibrium, which is what Allen always argued for and really earnestly desired. The battle between Allen and Bass exposes a very important dichotomy in environmental politics. That between the idealization of self-organization and the brutality of Darwinian evolution which was seamlessly transposed to social order and policy. In many ways, Biosphere 2 exhibits a mythology of consensus based on natural principles and furthers the belief that equilibrium can be translated to social policy and societal values. As a living experiment, the Biosphere 2 demonstrated that the limits of sustainability and the risks associated with closed ecosystems remain largely unknown. After years of self-reliance, Stuart Brand, that was the creator of the Whole Earth Catalog and who always fought for self-reliant systems, admitted that the idea of energy autonomy was a kind of hysteria. Brand's kinship between the closed system and the hysteric body is critical if one reflects on Freud's definition of hysteria as a physiological internal modification of the nervous system. To describe symptoms of hysteria, Freud spoke of closure as a type of modification that affects an organism alone instead of one that affects an organism and its surroundings. Psychoanalytically, this corresponds to a stage named the protopsyche, at which the organism has control over nothing except its own self. Ultimately, it functions like an ad hoc closed system that regenerates materials out of what is available within the borders of one body. Another important conclusion is that circularity has fostered a very dubious perception of Earth holding. And that means a progeny of Earth photographs that has been disseminated where the earth is held gently and affectionately by human hands, as if the earth is a wounded creature that needs care. This anthropomorphic perception of the earth as an endangered living species that is cute and sentient, as a being that needs to be petted by us humans, its conquerors, is absolutely delusional, as it positions our species at the center of all pivotal planetary developments. Our perception of the Earth as one interconnected world, as an image that promotes unity and balance, is no longer the case. Unilateral strategies for divergent problems in the ideological belief that the metabolism of the planet may become the foundation for technology, culture, and design is no longer applicable. The whole Earth catalog is not so whole anymore, or never was whole to begin with. So from that famous example that really was a colossal project of substantial venture capital and involved vast resources of experimentation, prototyping, and construction, 
we are going to pass to a very modest countercultural urban intervention that used minimal resources. The Integral Urban House in 1974 and the idea of digestive autonomy and the power of shit. As a project of an underground community group, we will look into the Integral Urban House that was a domestic organization in an urban setting envisioned by its founders as a healthy natural cyclical system. The project was initiated by Helga and William Olkowski and funded by the nonprofit organization Farallones Institute that was founded by Sim Vanderen that is considered a kind of early pioneer in sustainable architecture and at the time was the state architect of California. The actual site was a typical house in Berkeley, California that was retrofitted by the Farallones Institute into a highly productive test bed for self-reliance, resource renewal, and recycling of waste materials. What was mostly interesting was that the house was literally tied to the inhabitants with something of an umbilical cord. It needed constant maintenance and the dwellers were agreed to be linked to the house in a very corporeal way. So the ecosystem of the house was linked to the community of its stakeholders, each playing a specific role within a larger scheme of actions. According to its founders, it was significant to repeatedly explain a kind of action plan of life to all the members and commit to specific behavioral protocols before inhabiting the house, very much like in an anonymous um, support group. This format of habitation brings me to an important point that the occupant of a closed world is in many ways its own guinea pig. This is actually the saying of Buckminster Fuller in an anonymous essay, uh, guinea pig B, B for Bucky, um, where um, he, among others, argued that a guinea pig does not observe or speculate on possible outcomes. Rather, it is actually the subject of the experiment itself and is willful to insert its bodily parts into the action of the living experiment. The closed world dweller is therefore its feeder and caretaker. He or she monitors it closely and safeguards its operation. And some examples are Auguste Picard that you see on the screen that uh, launched himself, was the first person to launch himself to the stratosphere in this metal gondola along with his assistant in 1931. Um, he being um, the kind of, uh, part of a family of a long French legacy of balloonists um, and accidentally survived uh, because Eric currents um, were um, kind enough, let's say in quotations, to land him to the Alps. Evgeny Shepelev was the first human to, be, to remain in a closed system containing only chlorella, which is a type of algae, and lived with the oxygen only only produced by the algae for 90 hours, uh, also eating it as the only bioregenerative component in the Russian experiment Bio-3 in 1972. And British architect Graham Kane um, designed the ecological house and rarely left the premises of the house that he built and occupied, otherwise its biotechnical systems would degenerate and die. Here you see him portraying himself as actually part of the system generating energy, uh, feeding the primary digester through his own human excrements. So while ecological systems of the post-war period portrayed the inhabitant as an indispensable part of a building ecology, currently this image is dismissed. Environmental concerns promote a conservationist ethic and a list of cautionary daily practices of scarcity. And yet there is nothing more visceral as a participatory spatial experience than the scientist's voluntary containment inside the premises of the closed world. Returning to the urban house, the ambition overall was not to change the system holistically, but to reorient waste as a productive byproduct that fosters different kinds of pathways or more possibilities for each cycle of resources. 
food production yielded from the management of organic and inorganic waste was key to the integral urban house, as well as to several other domestic experiments at the time that heralded the idea of self-reliance from the grid of supplies. Making food from excrements was the ultimate aspiration, and this was carried through tedious, repetitive, and dirty routines like sorting, composting, mixing mulch for vegetation, and animal feed crops. With these aims in mind, the space of the house was nurtured and dependent on the subtle fluctuations of material phase changes and the growth of living substances. To achieve these challenging material conversions, the Institute researched on thermophilic bacteria that had the potential to create protein from the waste of livestock and in forming what they called bacteria soups that could break down cellulosic waste into protein for animal feed. This type of research was not only conducted by countercultural activists, but also from major industrial stakeholders like General Electric in their ongoing effort to chemically engineer bacteria that perform efficient tasks like eating toxins found in petroleum. Specifically, this guy, Ananda Chakrabarty, who was a microbiologist and genetic engineer that worked for General Electric in 1972, developed a man-made living organism which combined features of several strains of pseudonomous bacteria that would eat toxins found in petroleum. He attempted to patent the bacteria and the patent office rejected his proposal leading to a United States Supreme Court case that was quite famous, labeled the Diamond versus Chakrabarty case, focused on whether genetically modified organisms could be patented. The court ruled in Chakrabarty's favor, stating that the fact that even though microorganisms are alive, they are without any legal consequences for the purposes of the patent law. The court case nevertheless did raise ethical questions as to where life begins and what are the ethics involved in pre-engineering the autonomy of microorganisms. It has also silently introduced into the field of designing and building a field of semi-autonomy or disobedience of matter. It is a fact now that excrements may be turned into food and that Graham Kane and the Farallones Institute might have not been so delusional. Nevertheless, with the introduction of these questions into the field of architecture and design, one inevitably accepts that if ecological houses are in fact digestive machines, they're sometimes disobedient. And this is what autonomy means in many respects. Even though ecosystems are mostly simulated as robust circular systems where waste equals food, in a series of cycles and sub-cycles, the idea of self-sufficiency is compulsive and hysteric in the will to endlessly generate new life from shit. Therefore, to write a counter-history to optimize material circular economies, one needs to look at shit, because only through this raw confrontation may the ecology of life be somewhat useful. Shit forces us to look at questions of ecology viscerally via the raw ecology of our bodies and the understanding that recycling is not just a statistical problem that one can relay to the management of urban resources, but also a basic bodily reality that affects the water and the air we breathe. This unwanted, odorous, and degenerate bodily product has been described as technically powerful it can generate methane, meaning power, if treated properly. Then recycling shit to money is as much a subject of theoretical analysis as a factual constituent of capitalist production. Waste needs to go away. And this very process of purging, transporting, and carrying it into oblivion is utterly profitable for those who manage and transfer the raw materials. And this is one such example. New York City, the beating heart of global finance and culture, creates an enormous amount of poo. As reporter Oliver Millman writes in The Guardian, 
a substantial amount of the city of the city's shit is expelled to Alabama, causing major stink methane clouds 900 miles away. The treated sewage, euphemistically known in the industry as biosolids, travels by this train, the poo train, to a landfill in northern Alabama, causing what the locals call the death smell. In Alabama, the avalanche of northern poo is part of a wider concern over environmental risks for residents, particularly the impoverished and people of color. The dismissal of environmental concerns of Alabama residents, mostly residents of overwhelmingly African-American communities, has been reported as a case of civil rights and environmental racism. Let us not forget that more than immaterial, shit also indicates a general stage of incoherency degeneration and malevolence. It indicates a stage where information is so finely grained and scattered that it cannot form identifiable bonds. So from, from should we pass to compulsive happiness or the architecture of compulsive happiness and the experiment of Walt Disney in Epcot between 1966 and 1982? So the experiment of the closed world becomes a control city in Walt Disney's dream project, Epcot, an abbreviation for the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Epcot was a controlled, sanitized, and protected circular city, providing not only a new theme park of entertainment and leisure, but also new living patterns for what he wanted to think of as happy dwellers. Disney really believed that happiness could be designed by technology, and more specifically, that if one would regulate pollution, trash, ventilation, and electricity, and offer leisure and comfort, he would create happy dwellers. The Disney ideal offered, and here you see an entire audience dispossessed by the spirit of Mickey Mouse, which represents the ideal of Disney, that offered uncomplicated, wholesome entertainment inside Disney's own pre-engineered fantasy of the world, an idea which was as much a closed world as the physical city that he conceived himself. Epcot has been critiqued for subsuming the history of utopia, from Claude Nicolas Ledoux to Ebenezer Howard, from the American City Beautiful movement of the 1890s to Victor Gruen's urban models, along with the added benefits of improving air quality and weather comfort. It was a living laboratory in a technology showroom for future cities, just at the moment when cities throughout the world were decaying and disintegrating. In Epcot, each house had its own fuel cells and was connected to a centralized waste collection system, water supply, and living farm using swamp lands and filtering plants. The city was also connected via a monorail running through the center and tying all parts of the property. But most importantly, the city center was meant to be enclosed in a climatically controlled dome. This is something that he saw from Bucky Fuller in 1960 and literally copy pasted it as an idea to be manufactured in the middle of his own city that he designed. Overall, Disney has been largely critiqued by architectural critics, and here you see one such critique by Royston Landau, um, who was um, a tutor at the AA at the time, um, studying uh, the complexity of urban environments and uh, teaching cybernetics. Um, and his title was Mickey Mouse as the Great Dictator. It was critiqued by architectural critics for Disney's earnest belief in controlling human emotions through the sovereignty of territory and in the pursuit of happiness as a game of managing comfort and human physiology. This perception of life as a feedback loop of input and output as a process of combustion and oxidation was widespread in the design of the spacesuit as a life support system. And this is something that Disney was very much interested in and here you see also Mickey Mouse dressed as an astronaut. 
the idea of life as input and output and of um, creating happiness as a kind of input output uh, product was not only um, uh, prevalent in the understanding of the spacesuit, but also the understanding of trauma following World War II. Jewish psychiatrist and neurologist Viktor Frankl, in his best selling book, Man's Search for Meaning, that was written after his stay in a Nazi concentration camp, argued that the difference between those who lived and those who died came down to one thing their ability to find meaning in the most trivial, repetitive, and mechanical tasks of life. In his own words, happiness cannot be pursued, it must ensue, and could in fact ensue from the meaning of sustaining life through a series of problem-solving challenges. One such problem-solving challenge was Disney's creators of these underground channels called the utility doors. According to the American Magazine for the Design and the Environment in 1973, this was the biggest achievement of the Walt Disney World, the pollution control system, and the invention of utility doors, an underground network of, of tunnels that, was, that contained a series of systems to handle the waste that the park produced in an entirely circular closed system. This is not just something that was implemented in Walt Disney World, but was also experimentally implemented in Roosevelt Island in New York, where all of the buildings when the island was reconstructed in the late 1960s are connected to pneumatic tubes underground that move all the trash without any uh, vehicles needed to move trash to the end of the island and be uh, taken by a boat. But in any case, this idealization of the idea of circularity reveals a deeply rooted problem in environmental representation, and that is deduction. Deduction which is visualized almost exclusively with the use of arrows. Since the 1960s, ecologist Howard Odom's energy systems language Energess has instrumentalized ecosystems as well as human agency in terms of input and output. And you see here the kind of uh, feedback system of Disney uh, land as it was portrayed through arrows that take input and output from one place to the other. This representational language for ecological simulation models derivative directly from electronic circuits has become the primary tool for architects to visualize performance and energy flow. However legible all those do remove, however, a type of drawing agency that is critical to our field. Could alternative notation systems and fields effectively replace arrows, given that arrows point only to the end goal of all conversions, but say very little about the process of recycling itself. The Chilean biologist Francisco Varela argued that cognitive systems cannot be understood explicitly on the basis of their input and output relationships, but by their operational closure. Thus the language of environmental representation represents a process of interlinked threads while these threads and processes are trying to develop a relationship with themselves. In the environment, perception is therefore seen as a cognitive process of hypothesis formation, not as a simple prescription or reflection of pre-given information. A closed world along with its dwellers is a new type of unbalanced ecosystemic model susceptible to the shortcomings of digestion. What remains a paradox is the manner in which this model, imbued with the vitalism of a digestive stomach, has prevailed as a mainstream model in what we now call a sustainable net zero habitat opposing energy loss. In this light, it is critical to question to what degree resource conservation strategies are sustainable forms of practice, and also recognize how impossible ideas become institutionalized through a series of bureaucratic mechanisms and are eventually labeled as eco-friendly or even worse as green. And so just to give you a little bit of information besides the kind of content of the book, 
Closed World was kind of a larger project. It was an archive that would resulted into a book, but it was also an exhibition, an online lexicon, a website, and a number of courses. And this is one iteration of the first exhibition um, in 2016 at the Storefront for Architecture in New York, which is which strangely uh, manifests social distancing exactly by six feet. Um, uh, each cylinder, which is meant to be occupied by one individual, is six feet. Um, and a lot of people um, found that very uncanny, uh, including myself. This is the view of the exhibition as it was uh, laid out in the space and of the virtual reality environment where people were, were tethered to, uh, to these devices to experience a kind of recreated new digital reality uh, created by an artist, um, again, in a distance by six feet. Um, this is a second version of the exhibition in Los Angeles and a third in Sydney, Australia uh, last year, again, with a virtual reality component. And the kind of minor histories or side ideas, um, uh, figures of men, um, uh, kind of speculative ideas that became iconic in the history of architecture and environmental legislation. And this is part of the online lexicon that were a number of words that became important, not only as engineering uh, words that describe these projects, but also as words that describe spatial concept, like the concept, let's say, of acclimatization that describes uh, the preparation of a body to operate in a, in a particular climatic zone. So one of the questions that I'm asking in the end, is this a deviant or marginal story of architectural history? And in many ways, it kind of is because a closed world is like a death wish of the design object. And this was a critique that I received in one of the reviews uh, for this project, uh, particularly by Mimi Zeiger in Metropolis, who wrote that any of the projects represented in the book represent mostly feats of science and technology with architecture merely playing a part. And it is true that in many projects, closed worlds manifest a death wish of the design object. Yet architecture, is not replaced altogether with science and engineering. It is displaced from a field that shapes the use and form of the physical world to a sensorial immersive environment that copies and simulates the metabolism and the experiential aptitudes of the natural world. So far, the role of building technology has been to insulate spaces from environmental flows. This method has always suggested a moral discipline that protects buildings against disease, transferring an ideological framework of theology and ethics to the micro realm of materials. Nevertheless, in the new reality inundated with sudden climatic changes, methane gas clouds, oceanic islands of decomposed debris, and now the spread of COVID-19, a new role is cast to the notion of environment instead of environment being the inactive, static, and historicized context of an architectural object, the environment quite literally becomes the object of design itself. It is also not a marginal history because closed worlds reflect the modern human subject, which is immersed in a carefully curated replication or reverberation of the world as a pre-engineered fantasy. And this is something that if you haven't seen, it's, it's a hilarious video, um, which only lasts three minutes. Um, it's by Saturday Night Live. Uh, it was released in 2016. And it really takes Bucky Fuller's dome and transposes it from Manhattan to Brooklyn to shield um, uh, all the liberal progressive Americans who couldn't believe that Trump won the US elections in 2016 and did not want to live in that world. So within the bubble, they could um, have their own um, uh, money and talk to each other and, and really close off uh, all the voices coming from the outside. 
this is very telling because inside the unimaginable amount of information that we encounter daily in our lives, the only way to navigate is relative to oneself, or as French philosopher Quentin Meillassou has put it, in a relational loss with context. As a machine of ingestion and excretion, but also as a primal operator of labor and daily tasks, the sealed subject is both an experimental subject inside a larger experiment and the monitoring agent of the experiment itself. In this sense, bodies are expressions of change, carefully mapped and monitored inside. Within the premises of closed loop worlds, bodies are now reorganized, unpacked, and distributed in space to tap to any kind of resource. And this is the part where I'm sharing some new thoughts um, on how the situation might pertain to the reality that we experience today. Um, and um, some of these thoughts are uh, expressed in an article that came out in EFLUX today called Zoom In, Zoom Out. Um, and I'm returning here to the like Minister Fuller's and Soji Sadao's dome under Manhattan in the idea of the shield, the kind of thin barrier of separation um, that defines what is inside and what is outside and the possibility of breaching, of sealing, of closing something off or of regulating porosity in the way that we perceptualize barriers in architectural um, spaces. This is an image of a, of a movie by Damien Chazelle. Um, it is The First Man. And uh, here you see Neil Armstrong returning from the moon, being in quarantine for 21 days after his return, uh, touching his wife through a screen. And this is something that was actually a reality. This is the real image um, where the crew of the three returning astronauts from the, from the uh, moon uh, were speaking through a kind of complex communication system um, in the 1960s to uh, Nixon um, because they were obliged to quarantine to ensure that no contaminants, alien contaminants would um, kind of spread um, on earth and uh, disable all life on earth. This is the actual US Hornet, which was the quarantine facility and uh, the access, the kind of point that uh, the quarantined individuals would uh, face and communicate with people from the outside world. But this idea of, let's say, the airlock um, was not only um, an American idea coming to space, but to any kind of closed experiment where the separation of the subject inside and outside, the idea of containment and of communication uh, was, was very much part of a scientific imagery of recreating life anew using technological instrumentation. And this is an image from BIOS-3, the experiment in Russia, um, this particular photograph being taken in 1985. Another photograph in 1984, where the kind of um, contained subjects would uh, encounter um, other uh, people from the outside and communicate with them through a series of communication systems. And the possibility of controlled points of, of touching or entry um, to, uh, to deliver resources to check the physical health and well being of contained subjects. And this is a reality that we experience today if we look at these photographs from about 20 days ago. Um, in Brooklyn, New York, by Stephen Lovkin, that's a, a photographer for Shutterstock. Um, all the people inside and kind of suppression containment being the only reliable measure um, against uh, the spread of this, um, of, of, of COVID-19. Uh, these are some other images and the kind of constant messaging, the window becoming a kind of operable component both online in the way that we're all parts of uh, unilateral grids online um, and the window becoming a kind of uh, interface to uh, regulate porosity, to see outside, but also to express um, solidarity to one another. Um, 
so this is the reality that we live in now. While the thin border between the world as we know it and its decayed infested version was part of a science fiction imagery, Donna Haraway has always reminded us that the line between social reality and science fiction, fiction is an optical illusion. Closed loop ecosystems are digestive machines and as such, they're disobedient. Infestation can also come from within. In our new reality, in the age of extinction, we have revised how we navigate autonomy and territoriality from inside to outside. Renewed protocols for living and entering the household are forged. The process of departure and re-entry expands the thresholds of the door to an elongated space of serial decontamination steps. The door is now an airlock necessitated to enter the unfriendly and unforgiving void of a foreign planet outside. Our households are spaceships, while the outside has become a dematerialized, non-cohesive space where urbanity has transformed into a series of constellations or of essential places, supermarkets, gas stations, hospitals, and pharmacies. All else is erased in a newly formed mental desert. Our cities, are now vast arrays of disconnected bedrooms, microcosms that come together in an abstract digital space, physically enabled by data farms, which also constitute our vital and essential places, our current livelihood, although in most cases overlooked. With no hope of exteriority, the question becomes how long can we live in individualized containers? The desire to shrink the world to alter it and condense it to a manageable territory within confined borders is manifestly impalpable. Our current condition of detachment and restraint that speaks for long-standing ideals like autonomy, self-sufficiency, and individualism is nothing but a crumble of ruins. As mentioned before, it is in its own right a kind of hysteria. In this new world, we are possibly in dire need of a new kind of criticism, of new ways to fathom with interiorization, and of methods to move past barriers in the way that we narrate stories through the design of our environments, as well as the shaping of our reality. As citizens and creative thinkers, we need to zoom out and affect real change, now that returning to the long to normality, as was, is no longer attainable. As the famous movie line suggests, open your eyes, to the bubble inside which you're voluntarily contained. Then develop an erotic yet resistant relationship with your containment. In that way, it might be possible to penetrate barriers and imagine other ways of being, even to imagine some real grounds of hope beyond the market commodity of an economic and social euphoria for the few. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia, for, for a fantastic lecture. And I think also showing us or sharing with us something which seems to be a great resource to have as a book, but also, but also in all of its other forms, uh, you know, the, where the project is actually based. Uh, maybe we have like a little bit of time for questions, uh, if you have time. Absolutely. Uh, yes, great. I, again, I would like to, uh, encourage everybody to raise your hands and get and get in into the into discussion i'm still waiting for the book because i ordered it with a local uh, bookshop so it has not <laughs> have this of the, but by the time you arrive to vienna i'm pretty sure that the book is going to be is going to be uh, here uh, as well okay i look forward to that so uh, so if da, 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 i I have a few, few, few thoughts that kind of uh, came up, and uh, I'm happy to 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 go first. Is that if there is, uh, if the audience still needs a little bit to to digest and orient? It's but digestive was... economy, so they need time. Exactly, exactly, and let's give them the time. And um, 
maybe the first it's not it's not even so much so much the question but i was just wondering on your on your opinion actually on uh, also a little bit referring to the to the article that you wrote today for for efflux and yeah. um, and you were also uh, referring uh, to Slavoj Žižek, but what, what, what I was interested in is it somehow burned in my mind this uh, episode of Slavoj Žižek back in 2009 in this documentary, uh, Examined Life, uh, where he... Wait. The one with the, uh, where he's in the landfill. I just exactly. yeah, yeah, love that. <laughs> exactly. And nev ne we'll never forget it. It's like, oh my God, Slava. You know, that's awesome. Awesome. It stays with you forever. And at that time, I just looked it up uh, before quickly. And um, at that time, so he was talking about ecology, right? And, uh, uh, and at that time, he was kind of yeah. arguing arguing for for more alienation to become more artificial to develop an abstract materialism and i was just somehow to cut ourselves uh, our roots to nature even even more so i was wondering is this what is happening right now in a way um I've mixed, uh, so the last part with uh, open your eyes and develop an erotic relationship, this thing was, was actually inspired by this documentary of Zizek and Examined Life. I loved it. Not because, I mean, he's, he, uh, Zizek is always being um, provocative, right? And, yeah. and, and he, you know, by, uh, by saying to cut all roots with nature and love this constructed kind of nature, um, it's it's a premise to embrace and love and develop an erotic relationship with artificiality. Mm -hmm. Now, I I'm not sure if this is exactly our situation right now. There mm -hmm. are, there are mixed versions of it, but uh, one thing that is definitely happening is that uh, this idea of verb, let's say, encased, virtualized type of nature mm -hmm. that is absolutely controlled, which is something that has been already in place by major corporations for capital gain, not for right. a human gain, um, is, is definitely prevalent. Like Amazon, for example, if you know this project, has created in downtown Seattle, the Amazon biospheres, um, which are this absolutely controlled type of natural environment like jungles, and they did that not because they were nice and they believe in sustainability, obviously, but because they wanted to um, enhance the productivity of workers. And uh, neurological mm -hmm. analysis has proved that uh, the productivity is enhanced through the presence of plants and the biophilia hypothesis. Right. So definitely we have, we, we definitely are witnessing a kind of mediated relationship with natural settings. Uh, where we control the level of contact um, and, um, and, and these kinds of environments that were um, before the epidemic, a kind of heightened com combination and hubris of late capitalism to, to create nature anew as a, as, as a, as a kind of um, hubris of, of being God. Um, is is something that is uh, that that is becoming essential right now because people people need that. So um, a lot of these places have become essential too because we do need some contact. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a lot of people grow plants in the in their gardens and their. Um, I mean, we we too, right? We we have a lot of them in the balcony and. Uh, and uh, we take care of them as you don't see it but it's my basilicum <laughs> yeah yeah we 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 do need them so uh, at, at the same time i think that it's some something very important is that besides this kind of hyperbole of mediation and the kind of which was already at play there's another really important lesson um from all of this which is our contact with the material ramifications of the world. And uh, this is something that was beautifully written by Bruno Latour in his book, uh, Down to Earth. Like he, it was written just a couple of years ago. And um, he was talking that at some point there's going to be that, that climate change, deregulation and inequality, this kind of uh, set of 
of, of three evils is going to land on Earth. Mm -hmm. And um, even though climate change should not land on, something else landed on Earth, uh, which is very much material. And it makes us question uh, the material presence and reality and, and the kind of fragility of our, of our, of our existence, um, which is perfect for climate change because mm -hmm. we could very well abstract the idea of climate change to something that would not affect us as, as physical entities. Mm -hmm. And and I think that that's very very important relative to um, to our perception of the environment too. Mm -hmm. um, and but I do want to mention a third thought based on what you're saying. It has become clear clear to me than ever before that we are effectively as architects called to design environments in in a larger and expanded way not just spaces that are that are shaped by physical boundaries what that means because spaces are not no longer you know housing it's not just that they're housing bodies uh we understand space through the intersection of different bodies today yeah. we think of space of you know now and i'm sure everybody that's that's the same reality for everybody today you think of something and who has touched it before you. You think of intersections of bodies. You think of who is close to you and who is far from you. So our perception of space has become um, a kind of series and networks of intersections of, of things, right? Of, and, and our perception of bodies, or of our bodies that are porous entities, is you know as porous entities we exhale right so mm -hmm. we are fields of droplets of, of 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 droplets that float in the air so all of this reality um which is surfacing through the the, the pandemic i think will play a major role in the way that we design and think of environments in the future mm -hmm. Let me see if anybody is already ready to join us. Yes, I hear some no? I don't see a, ah, yes, Konstantinos is ready. Come on, please. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks a lot for your, for your super interesting lecture. I just wanted to like to, to comment or ask you like whether this thing is like, is more of an epistemological issue, right? I see, most of these, and yeah, in the in, in the context of architecture, we tend to be positivistic, and most of these examples are around mm. like the late sixties, which was also like hippie culture, ecology, and cybernetics, which wanted to kind of construct a certain um, environment that can be engineered that have to do with the enumerated and with the nameable, and which is, I think, certain gestures that that are um, kind of in an outspoken way, in non-feminist in some way. If we like, if we, <laughs> uh, if we go into- I'm sorry, the, say that again? Like they're, they're kind of in an outspoken way, non-feminist, let's say. Um, so you mentioned, for example, Haraway or- uh, Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We have a, a, like, and I think this positive is that we kind of inherit in architecture because we have to, we have to work within these kind of assumptions as working models for addressing whatever it is that we do. Uh, we end up in the, into these paradoxes that, and, and these kind of grand projects that tend to um, to kind of create a caricature of the environment, as you showed, as a domestication of, a, of ecology, as something that is, as you said, cute and um, endangered, and that we are on top of that. Uh, yeah, and like out of that, what I wanted to, like something else that came to my mind, out of your references, was this essay from uh, Forster, the machine stops, if you know that. It's from the early... Heinz von Forster? E.M. Forster. And the, 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 it's a short story, and it's called The Machine Stops. And it's, in a, it's super interesting. Uh, because it's in a future, it's in a future. It's, yeah, it, it was like a, a century ago. But it was in a situation that um, everybody was living in containers individually. Uh, ruled by this machine and this machine was like it had everything internet skype whatever and they compl they were completely alienated from the from each other and from the environment and that was their nature and in in its breaking down slowly slowly what they witnessed was silence 
as first time in their lives, which I think is like what we living in also in, uh, I haven't read your essay from today, but um, the other thing about this closed system is that we in, the, in a zoomed out scale, we do live in a closed system of capitalism. And I think what we kind of yeah. come these days in its breaking down of this huge edifice is that we kind of slowly we're experiencing a new type of silence in some way, breaking free of this system. Yeah, so, that's a very, very interesting and poignant conversation. Uh, I, I'm, I, I have not read this. Uh, I, I, I'd love it if you can send me a link to the story that you mentioned. I would love to read it because independently of this work, uh, I'm writing a book on um, uh, the work of uh, Taki Zanetos, uh, which uh, you probably know, um, and his project on electronic urbanism which has a very similar reality. It was a utopian project in the, between the 60s and 70s um, where all humans were encased in, um, in these kinds of, of, of bubbles. So it's, it's a narrative project, so I'd love to, uh, to read it. But uh, silence is a very, very interesting um, example. And mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if Rachel uh, Carson was talking about the silent spring, um, which, which was the absence of, of silence from, from insects, uh, pesticides as a, as a kind of um, way to indicate the ecological imbalances of the planet. There's a new kind of silence that we experience today, which is complemented, I would say, not just by the absence of sound, by a kind of loss of cohesion with, a, with their sense of of spatial coordinates, like uh, or or the outside, um, the the silence is accompanied by uh, by this kind of altered perception of what is outside, um, almost as if the city has been silenced, not just in terms of sound, but also in terms of where everything is and why, and it it mm -hmm. has become this kind of deserted unilateral uh, landscape where physical locations don't really matter, proximities matter, and um, a relationship between bodies matter, and what is close to you matters. So um, it's a very, very interesting observation, and I'm not sure how to answer your question. Um, but in general, what I want to say is something very hard for me is that I am very interested in epistemology as in, in studying architecture and in looking at this uh, material, not just from um, a kind of an, the perspective of an environmental analyst uh, or, or the perspective of an, of, but as, as the perspective of a citizen and, um, and uh, with, with political beliefs, uh, with, um, with, with opinions as we all have, and to intertwine all of these narratives into the way that we um, that we narrate stories about the construction of our environment, um, and it's it's a very hard thing to do. And and I I for once have been largely critiqued on that that I'm blending too many too many things at once. Mm -hmm. But I'm very interested in the breaking point of epistemologies and the breaking point of disciplines, not in the abstract version of interdisciplinarity which is a kind of, let's say, false or pseudo um, desire at many, at many points, but um, in kind of um, a blunt encounters, let's say, of, of different scientific viewpoints. You know, if you, if you put a building scientist to talk to an anthropologist, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think that even though everybody is for interdisciplinarity, this is a very, very difficult uh, reality to, um, to, to, to physically put together. I don't know if I've answered your question. I think I've, I've, I have not, but, um, um, yeah, it was, it was, maybe it was just a rumble, but yeah, thank you. No, I just wanted, wanted to add from like from the, from the story that I would certainly send you is that like the, the machine is breaking down and at some point they say, like, what you, what you don't know is that the machine hums. It's like when you hear a sound for, for too long and then it suddenly stops, and there's mm -hmm. kind of a certain freedom that you feel after a sound that was there forever kind of stops. It's kind of like this. And I think like under mm -hmm. this period that we, we kind of also feel that whoever was relevant within this system 
that we are all kind of contributing until like two months ago. Now we're at home doing Zoom meetings, right? And then, and then we have like all the care workers and the what we call now essential workers who are more relevant to this. Anyway, we have a new realization of this of this thing, which I, I think like just to extrapolate that we live uh, like the systems that you uh, uh, that you describe, which are kind of mini systems. I, I, we, I think we can extrapolate that to the concept of the world that we're living in, because we're yeah. living in a in a conception of the world. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for for these very brilliant comments. I'd love to talk more about it. Yeah, sure. There is Michael with his hand. Hi. Oh, hands are humming. Hi. Thank you for the awesome lecture. Super inspiring. Um, if you would indulge me, I'd like to get into the shit a little bit. Okay, uh, let's go for shit. <laughs> um, it's it's funny that you're talking about this, and maybe you answer it in the book. Let's see. But uh, a few days ago, some of us in Studio Lynn were talking about the kind of extent of the efficacy of architecture and making statements about uh, you know food systems or the relationship to excrement. Um, and there's a kind of a question that arose of if you don't have physical contact with the thing, then it's hard to de develop an aesthetic around it, um, which I think is why we deliver shit away from the city as rapidly as possible in the least feasible way um, with the explicit intent to not have an aesthetic of it. Um, and so a couple months ago, I was visiting Arco Santi and they said they have this, they have this crazy new natural um, septic treatment pond that's doing it completely naturally. And I asked about the scale of it. Um, so I think Paolo originally wanted to have like 5,000 people at Arco Santi. And now there's about 150, give or take, except for that festival that they have. And the pond they have, which I think is like three or four acres, only sustains, I think, just that population, so 150. So the scale doesn't fit. And if we scale that up to, say, New York, we might need like all of New Jersey, which a big part of it is a septic tank, uh, to be fulfilling the needs of, of New York. And personally, I want to see that happen, but I'm wondering how we integrate these two things. If for one, if it's even necessary to integrate spatially and formally these systems to, to keep it close on so that we can have an aesthetic established around these cycles of, of energy and matter. And two, um, if it is necessary and we say we need to keep these things close at hand and visible, how you see these things being integrated uh, with the scales and, and formal materialization that would be required to put them into the city? It's a very good question. The question of scale is a super, a super important question. Um, I'm certainly not suggesting to create a septic tank for every building and uh you know replace the city by uh, a number of odorous um piles of poo um but it is there is a very big economy that is uh that is the byproduct of exporting or outsourcing all of the kind of outcomes of our daily production processes to these disenfranchised terrains outside of our jurisdiction or uh, with, with cheap real estate. And uh, shit is part of that. Um, it's, it's very important because shit besides like a material, it's not plastic, you know, it's, it, it smells, it, 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 it's organic, it, it has like a very distinctive physical um, unwanted odorous presence. And uh, I, I did study with uh, a genetic engineer um, when I was developing a, Mar a system for Mars uh, recently this year, actually, the possibility of creating small scale digestures and uh, the possibility of contributing to grid and also the possibility of eliminating odors by infusing certain strings of, um, of new DNA. And uh, there, are, there is research on that. Uh, it doesn't need to be a huge infrastructure element. Um, I think I think it is, but but the, the the problem is, I don't know what the solution is, and I'll be very honest. Like I, but there's no research on that yet. There's no there's no research on developing like if you exclude systems of biocomposting, 
uh, of, you know, the Clivus Multrum system that takes shit and puts it in the ground and like makes kind of, uh, you know, uh, there are no systems that uh, have septic tanks and digesters integrated within building systems to, to feed back to the grid. Um, and uh, there's no system because the development of these kinds of infrastructures uh, would, uh, would not be financially beneficial because they would contribute very little to the overall uh, power chain of, of, of the building and would be very expensive to make. And, um, but overall, uh, the winner of such a scenario would be the city or the disenfranchised terrains or which receive this, this kind of material. So it's a very subtle balance of, of efficiency, but also the whole kind of capitalist game of exporting and importing um, these unwanted streams of, of waste out of big metropolitan environments. Um, in a similar way that uh, there are boats leaving New York with electronic waste, and until recently they went to China to create villages that would disassemble the electronic waste with cheap labor, there's, there's now, there's entire para economies developed out of this. And, um, and I think technology can be useful um, to not eliminate these para economies, but really offer um, kind of new points of departure for um, for this. Now the size the size is important, so it's not it, it's it's about I think creating microgrids rather than uh, new kinds of of infrastructures and and a combination of both. I don't know if that answers your question, but that's my thinking process so far. Yeah, that's super informative. Thank you very much. I just wonder because, like in in the in the rural, for example, animal shit has a very romantic quality to it, and yeah. it's something that you like to smell. But all of a sudden, in the urban, it's the reverse, and it seems to me that there has to be a ton of design involved, and in, as you mentioned, yeah. some really interesting distributed technologies. So, thank you. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. If it's okay, I see two more hands. Uh, yeah. So, Simon. I think you were the next in a row. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, thanks for the great talk. I already have a book here. Oh, thank you. I can't hear you. Who, who is? Oh, there. There you are. Do you see? Uh -huh. <laughs> um, I will have like two questions, hopefully not two large ones. One is a philosophical question or like more more an idea i was or like i have to I have to jump in with that as like you said like this closed worlds or like a death wish um of the designed object and i would mm -hmm. really wonder what graham Harmon would say to that from from object oriented from poetry. <laughs> we get objectified to it but i think that's a bigger topic to to talk about how this could still be engaged with architecture but i think it's very it takes it takes somehow on our responsibility as, as architects somehow to define that, right? Um, I don't know. And uh, Graham uh, has surprised me at many reviews. Um, I'll actually give you an anecdote before going uh, to, your, to your question. Um, we were, uh, he was teaching a studio at Yale with uh, Mark Foster Gage. Right. And, um, he invited a number of people and he said this review is a philosophical review and it's not about where the stairs are and where the entries are and uh, you know all that and we have to engage in an intellectual level and uh, when we were trying the architects were trying to be very theoretical in our comments and Graham Harman was asking like this stair is too difficult for me to get up uh, and I will get very tired um, and uh, you know as I'm getting old I think this is a difficult environment for me to uh, to live in and, and he was making these kinds of comments and we thought it was hilarious so you never know you never know what he would say but um, but relative to the question of formal logic and uh, um, and the death wish of the design object um, I think that um, we there's a very long legacy of of um, machine performance and um, a kind of long ethos of ma machine expressionism using machines to convey an ethos of performance, which is so explicitly, uh, let's say, illustrated in, in famous works like the Pompidou uh, or other 
works by uh, by contemporary architects that put machines in the in in the front in the front face. Uh, so it is not really a question of how machines become architecture, but uh, something that that we have realized while again working on this project for Mars is that uh, machines create specific environmental conditions of uh, heat excess, of uh, comfort that that create environments around them. And if they're inhabited, um, if they're designed uh, for habitation in one way or another, um, not in the metaphorical sense that Le Corbusier's uh, vision was, was for modernism, but in a very mm -hmm. literal sense, right? Like this part of the machine has excess heat, so it can be a nice, a nice cozy lounge for people to feel very warm. Um, I think it, 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 it's, it's a very architectural project. And so my, my view on that is that it, I, I disagree with the critique that uh, closed worlds are the death wish. I, 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 think, I think it's a question of how we can design living uh, uh, machines, not just that perform tasks, but are creating and suggesting new formats of, of um, of, of empathy with objects, of designing objects, spaces, um, and so forth. And um, I've, I've tried to do that, uh, not very successfully, I have to say, in the, la the latest project that I, that I did, Life on Mars. Uh, but it's something that really occupies my, my mind recently. And um, I'm on the side, I would say, quite clearly, that uh, it, this is a very architectural project and not a kind of uh, project where machines are an adjunct um, series of gadgets that, that complement spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would also say, like, I think what you try to, to get in your head is like a compromise between these two very distinct properties of like the machine and like the, the living space or what it might be. Um, this kind of leads me over to the to the other question: What we have currently in our own kind of environment that we're locked in, we don't know what's going uh, on on the outside, or we're very unsure. And it seems like we're locking the door from inside by ourselves, so nobody has to do anything from the outside. And our long-term evolved ideal internet or like digital world at the moment is now our prominent space and mediator to the outside world and it's it's a question of time at the moment but we're going to get back and over this crisis at the moment for sure but the question for me if the crisis is or not is what do we do with that other side of the screen at the moment as i see just the development currently just is absolutely going in the direction of the digital since years and I just don't see this ideal to, I don't know, I, is, is it admirable? You know, you know what I mean? Uh, I'm trying. So what do you mean, what do we do with the other side of the screen? What do we do with you? I see kind of this both, like the physical world and the digital world evolve in the same, like they, they're like a conversation um, back and forth the whole time. But since a few years now, the, the digital just takes on and just goes on and everything what we do is super digital at the moment. If it is VR, AR, uh, the whole development of construction, everything is like in the ideal. And we even, we kind of copy our centers, everything into the digital to perceive that from there. And I just kind of consider like, okay, what's with the physical space? We also should go on with that. Yeah? So that's like what to do with the other side of the screen. And I think like you're taking even like historically very much on on this like what does it what does it mean for for us to be in like in that um physical world we are set in yeah well it's there's not one answer to that um and and i'm if i take sides i I'm I'm with the landing process, the the kind of uh, material raw reality of bodies. You you have a body, right? Uh, it it breathes and uh, it needs air quality, water, um, and and so forth. So I think that um, 
even though we're realizing that these kinds of portals, these windows, this kind of abstraction of the grid as we experience it at this moment is a very real portal of communication, solidarity, and um, exchange of ideas that we desperately need to maintain our livelihood. Um, we also need, um, and this is a very romantic position uh, probably, we need to touch each other <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we need physical presence as well. And, um, and I think this is a very primordial, existential, primitive um, human desire that we cannot negate. Um, so whether the world will become more digital, uh, probably yes, because there's no solution, um, because this is, uh, this is the only portal of communication at this moment, because we don't know if travel or the hubris, so if, if the way that we traveled was even possible, like maybe we have, we have overcome a breaking point in the way that we were traveling as physical realities and that's no longer needed as as we have done it um but um i i'm i'm definitely thinking that um the physical is there and it will be there and uh behind this screen um you have um smells and an apartment and a sensorial environment that is very much constructed as the kind of curated stage set of, of your screen. I, and I don't know if I like what I'm saying right now because it's very romantic. Um, and, uh, but, but it, is, it is real, no? Like it is, we, we do have, we're not, we're, we're not only an augmented reality. <laughs> Another question for Graham. <laughs> Right. I'll think about it more. I'm not. I'm not satisfied with my answer. <laughs> but no, no, I wasn't like searching for like. It's definitely not one answer to the like. As I said, there are so many positions. But thank you. Sure. But maybe Lydia, if you're so kind, and I think maybe that's the perfect close. Might be the perfect closing question. Also, referring back to the Mars project, I would like to invite Barbara to Imhof to. Uh, yes. The jump in. <laughs> Hi, hello. Uh, first of all, fantastic lecture. I've heard about uh, you already, and we wanted to invite you to a um, to the International Astronautical Congress. I think one or two years ago, at Christina Chadulo sent you. An oh invite, yes, I think yes. So uh, <laughs> I would, I would love to come. I just have two babe. Well, now they're not. I had two babies, and it makes life complicated. But I can zoom now. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Um, anyway, uh, so so my my background is in space architecture. This is what I'm doing uh, for my daily life. One strain, and the other is um, uh, working on research and development projects. Integrate uh, part of it is integrating biological systems mm -hmm. uh, into uh, how houses or exchanging the HVAC uh, into more biology, and also working with scientists who engineer the microbes, who mm -hmm. you know, process the shit, um, and, um, and maybe also retrieve phosphates from gray water or so. That was, that was a, a project uh, with Rachel Armstrong uh, under the theme living architecture. So you might oh, be wonderful. familiar with that. Yeah, so yeah. so just, that's just the context uh, because my question is actually, because you're talking about closed worlds. I mean, I could, so I wonder if you give any scale to that. You showed the, um, what was it? Uh, the Tuntup the or Hausrucker. I think the Hausrucker little jar in the beginning. Yeah. And then the the Buckminster Fuller, you know, dome uh, later on. So these are very different scales. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And um, um, and but I could also argue, you know, the Earth is a closed uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, environment, and and it's it's hardly penetrable for humans to you know to penetrate the atmosphere to get out of it, and it's very and and it's it's you know how can I say it's um. And it's a very different system than this very machine machinistic um, system, and and so I just wonder to to which extent because you I mean you touched it but you haven't mentioned it but if one of yeah. your future engagements or like follow up will be more about the 
integrating living systems, microbes, um, you know, bioreactors, and maybe also thinking about um, an environment which is more alive. And maybe, yeah, it, it might, you know, uh, stink a little bit, or you might see different yeah. kinds of fungi or, or something. But then on the other hand, to to the to the ability to to engineer microbes, we might even you know after a longer you know the next the next step might be even getting rid of of all that what we think is is not um, you know, conducive to our living uh, in in our living rooms basically. I mean, so so it's a matter you know where do you stop with your scale you know. Is yeah, I, um, that's an excellent question. And, and it is, it is a question that I have thought quite a bit, um, especially because when I visited the biosphere and, uh, two in Arizona and they give us a tour, they showed us the, the kind of work that they, they explained as part of like the history of that project, that the biosphere two was inspired by the studies of a microbiologist in Hawaii called Claire Odom and showed us these bottles of, uh, of closed worlds, very similar to the iconic representation of Haas Rucker Co. So all of his experiments work to create a kind of balanced ecosystem in that scale. But when you, when, when you transpose that to this really large scale, all of these unexpected consequences um, kind of emerged, um, which you really, and, and this is something that I'm discussing in the book, that um, as architects, because of the idea of geometric similitude, if you have a triangle, you can scale it up and up and up and up, and it's the kind of same principle, um, um, that idea transfers to thinking that uh, biological systems can equally be scaled up and down, and it's absolutely not the case, not just because of um, of, of, of questions of formal inefficiency, like Darcy Thompson showed mm -hmm. um, in his book, where he showed like an elephant that, you know, if you scale him up, like the legs won't work and all of these things. It's not just a question of, of, of statics and uh, mechanical failure. It's also a question of the rhythm within which different kinds of microbial communities and different kinds of species scale up. And that became very clear to me. Um, you know, I did building science, but I'm not a scientist uh, per se. But um, I was in a conference in Arizona with scientists um, in, in December. It was organized by another, the CNRS. It was some space agency um, also. Um, and one of the scientists was, was studying the scaling up and down of organisms. And um, in his, you know, very... Uh, very important diagram, there are different rhythms of change in different microorganisms. So if you scale up an ecosystem, you have different rates of change. And, and so it becomes a very complex conundrum. Like it, it's, a, it's a conundrum, right? What, how you can engineer, how you can design a system that contains life um within a kind of space and whether you can replicate that or blow it up and down um you basically have to study each case individually and differently um and do its own uh its own survey for that um i think for for my for the purposes of the book i i didn't have a limit into the scale i conceptualized a closed world from a bottle to a city, um, not because I think they're the same and they can be blown up and down without friction or without ramifications, uh, but because um, the perception of demarcation of boundaries and of, of regeneration within confined borders, uh, this kind of principle applies to many different kinds of projects and many different kinds of scales. But that doesn't mean that you can take one and make it um, extremely small and make one and make it extremely so so I think it's a very important question that uh, will define the limits of, of scientific research um, when we try to use synthetic biology and kind of life within um, ecosystems and um, in, in my work with a genetic engineer um, I'm very much trying to 
um, to, to think about this problem. So thank you so much for your really brilliant question. But isn't it just uh, one follow up, isn't it just a matter of, of more concentrating on the actual system and designing uh, the, the system and not, you know, if I, you, you know, I can always, how can I say, maybe it's an architectural uh, perspective to um, that we think we can just, you know, add the, the, the pyramids or whatever the, the forms, but actually um, if we start thinking about, okay, we have to, we have a small system, we have a larger one, um, and then um, it's difficult to hear. Is it? No, no, I, uh, my, computer, okay. my computer is running out of it and I don't want it to, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No problem. It needs power. Yes. So, so, I, wouldn't you agree it's about the the understanding the the system and that it's one of uh, an important architectural um how can i say uh a, a task to to do to, because now we always say okay this is hvac this is behind the walls we don't see it and some other people deal with it but if we want to change you know the the whole how can i say the uh -huh. environment then probably we have to look at these things in a completely different way as a as a complete systems of 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 humans and microbes and you know all different yeah. kinds of I, I I agree. It's it's uh it's very much true what you're saying. Um and um it, it's very true that uh as architects we're very uh, familiar with geometric similitude and we, we think that we can scale uh, systems up and down, but uh, systems require a different kind of, of of study and examination. I, for once, tend to think of systems and design as indivisible, as one problem. Um, something that I'm kind of critical mm -hmm. of is the division of a system as a flowchart and the division of a system as a design element. And, um, and, and I think that um, in you know, a flow chart, which is a diagram where things become this and that and have ratios and another layer, which is how we design the system. So um, I, I'm personally trying to think of these two layers as, as one, even though it is very much in fact in the design of the system that, um, that scale investigations become very applicable and pertinent to. Thank you. You're very welcome. Lydia, I think, thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for taking the time, for the openness to discuss uh, the questions. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's really wonderful to connect uh, across, uh, across the Atlantic with all of you, uh, to hear your really intelligent voices and to, to be with you. And I hope we can touch each other one day. <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. So all the best on the on the other continent. And your day just has started, so probably you go now to teaching uh, little 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 kids. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I'm going to teach studio like in five minutes. <laughs> ah, okay, okay, then. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you. It was really great to see you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Lydia. bye. bye.